All throughout scripture, uh, the Bible shows us that God's people prayed and fasted. And you see this about 70 times. There's about 70 times where you'll read that the people of God fasted. Well, certainly that's just indicative that they did this quite a bit. It wasn't just 70 times that they did it throughout history, but you can read that many times where the people of God did fast, and every time they fasted, they would pray. And so when we talk about fasting, we also are talking about prayer because it's a companion to a season of fasting, and that's why we always talk about them together. And some of the times you'll see when the people of God fasted, there was uh, such a time of conflict in their world. There was a, a difficulty that they were facing. Often they would do this in the face of a national crisis or even just a a crisis that they were experiencing as the covenant people of God, Israel. And so the Lord would call them to fast. The Lord rebuked them, in fact, sometimes when they did not fast or if they fasted improperly. They did it with an unrighteous motivation. And so God called them to the fast that he required, the fast that he desired For them. But I believe, just like we read about in Scripture, that the time is upon us as well. And I think it is always the case that it's not only a spiritual discipline, but I think that this is a season where when the people of God are asking, What can we do? What must we do? The Bible is very clear that we must fast and we must pray. We have to be a people that humble ourselves before God. And fasting is a God-ordained way of humbling ourselves, as we're going to see tonight. It's not some divine diet or a way we prove to God that we're serious, although it does say that we are serious. It's not proof of that necessarily, but it is, in a sense, us moving toward God, and we are, in fact, focusing on the Lord. The reason that we're calling this focus Focus 2021 is because it's what we're doing. We're focusing on the Lord and not the peripheral. We're focusing on God and not the other things around us because the voices in our world are lobbying for our attention right now. We are in a warfare of sorts. And oh, how sometimes, and I hate to say it this way, somebody said this to me or around me at some point today, that when you have an actual physical war, you at least know who's fighting who, And it's very clear and apparent, but when you're in an ideological warfare, when you're in a war of ideas, of misinformation and disinformation and a lack of clarity, and you don't know who's against who and who's for what and what's for what, and if somebody's lying or when you're in that type of warfare, it can be quite confusing. But I'll tell you what, our warfare that we are waging is a warfare that scripture clarifies. And that's why the people of God have got to focus in on the Lord because we cannot afford to be confused right now. You and I cannot afford to be confused. And I'll tell you something, I'm not confused. I'm not saying that arrogantly. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. But I don't feel confused about what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Every now and again, I get a challenger. You know, I get somebody, and for some reason, it's never usually an unbeliever. I don't know why that is, but it's usually a believer who thinks for some reason that I might be confused, but I feel like I'm quite clear. I mean, there are questions that I have, amen? Amen. Things I haven't figured out, I don't know how to do or whatnot, but listen, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing in on God. I want everything he has for me. I want everything he has for our church. I want his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing's changed. As far as I'm concerned, the gospel's got to go forth. People's lives got to get saved. Hell is still real, but so is heaven. And so this is time for us to get fired up because we know something others don't know. We have something that others don't have, and we've got enough to share. And so I'm not confused. And the thing that fasting does is it focuses in on the thing that we can know. You know, it's so popular today to say this funny phrase. People, people, people say, I don't know. You ask them a question about something, well, I don't know. It's the agnostic way, right? It's, I don't know. Who can know? How can you know? Well, what do you know? I feel like asking people all the time, what do you know? This I know for the Bible. Come on. That's it. What do you I'm not interested about what you don't know. There's a lot about there, out there you don't know. But what do you know? It's so popular to say, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not interested in I don't know. We need to be quite clear. And I'll tell you what, when you start fasting and praying, yes, you can get a little irritated. Yeah, you can get a little uptight. Yes, your stomach can growl a little bit. Or you've experienced withdrawal from the thing you're saying no to, absolutely. 
And all of that is a reminder of what you are doing. We can't be consumed with what we're not doing and and allow that to overtake us. What it does is it reminds us that we're saying no to something in the natural because we're focusing on God and we're laying hold of that which is spiritual. And when you do something like fasting, what you know is for sure in scripture is when the people of God do something in the natural and they do it by faith, there are spiritual results. Wherever you read in scripture, you will see people do things that, quite frankly, don't always make sense. You can follow the story of scripture. Moses, why don't you put put your staff over the Red Sea? I mean, if I was Moses, I'd say why. I mean, I wouldn't say it out loud, but I'd be thinking it. Throw your staff on the ground. What's, I mean, it might break. I'm a logical person. All of these things, you do something in the natural by faith as you follow God's word. When you do what God tells you to do in the natural, you don't always feel like something's gonna happen, but what we know scripture teaches from beginning to end, when the people of God do something in the natural by faith, according to God's word, there are spiritual results. And oftentimes when we fast, we go, Pastor Ben, I fasted for a long period of time, 24 hours, And when I was done with that long period of time, you know, I'll give it to you. Sometimes that feels like a long stretch. But I fasted for a long period of time and I didn't see anything happen. I didn't see an angel. I didn't dream a dream. I didn't have a vision. The only vision I had was vision of food. That's it. That was because you were watching the cooking channel and that was a bad idea. (laughs) Nothing happened. Well, sometimes God's doing something that maybe we're not seeing because it's not what we're looking at. And so the reason we're calling this focus is because that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna focus on the Lord. And I want you to be sure of this. The promise of scripture says, Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him, that's what we're doing. We're coming to God in fasting and prayer. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and we obviously do, and that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. That's what fasting is. Fasting is earnestly seeking God. We're gonna move out our seat. We're gonna do something that we don't typically or normally do, and we're gonna stretch ourselves. We're gonna move ourselves towards the Lord. And as we do that, we're not doing that hoping. We're doing that believing that God is gonna reward those who earnestly seek him, especially those that are seeking God for the reward of God. If you get nothing else, you will get the presence of the Lord. You will have the presence of the Lord. And sometimes when you fast and you pray in seasons like this, what will happen is I believe our spirit is like a reservoir. And God will begin to fill up that reservoir. God will pour into our spirit when we obey him in seasons like this because he's got something that he wants to do in March. And when you begin to do things in the Lord, like obey him in this way, you store up in Christ what God wants to give to you and it will be dispensed at the proper time. That reward may not come in 21 days, that reward might come in March because there was something that you laid hold of in January that you needed God to release in March, April, May, and June. And friends, this last year has taught us that we need God to move, not just in 21 days from now, but in 21 weeks from now. And as we begin to seek God the way that we're about to seek God together as a family, be sure of this, when you look around this room and all of us that are online as a church, we can be sure absolutely certain, more than putting your money in the savings account in the bank, that God himself is going to respond to you. And he might respond to you and I in a way that we're not asking him for because we can't see what we need. Did you, (laughs) January 6th of 2020, know what you were about to need? (laughs) No, no. So I hope that as we step onto the scene of this new year, and let's just, let's just go one week at a time, shall we? As we step onto the scene of this new week, amen, we'll treat it like a year. We know that what unfolds in a week, all right, God can handle. But in the flesh, we're going to blow it. We're going to mess it up. We're going to make a mess. 
It's dangerous for us to function by the flesh. And what fasting can do is deny the flesh as we focus on the Lord. Amen. Amen. We see it in the Old Testament quite a bit. The New Testament a little bit less because it is shorter. But there are moments that we read about fasting quickly. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for fast literally means to cover the mouth. You know the obvious interpretation there. In New Testament, it means to abstain. It means to say no. It's always connected to food. In Leviticus 16.31, Israel was always required to fast on the Day of Atonement and other occasions as well. That was the only day that they were commanded to fast. I am not saying God is commanding you to fast. I'm saying God is inviting us into fasting. And that's the power of it is choosing. Just like prayer, we can watch television or we can pray. We can read a book or we can pray. We can hang out with someone or we can pray. There's a choice. When we draw near to the Lord, he draws near to us. The scripture is absolutely true. And so obviously we're not saying we're going to do that every waking second of the day, but the more minutes that we give to the Lord, the more opportunity that we have to draw near to him, know him better, hear from him more clearly, and obviously move forward in obedience with what he is calling us to do. And so historically fasting is about abstaining from food for a period of time so that we might draw near to God and see him release what he wants to do. It's all about the will of the Lord. That's what our life is about. And a lot of times our life becomes about a lot more than the will of God. And so I look at this season as a type of house cleaning. When you go through your house and you begin to clean out things, and I don't know about you, but this last couple weeks, just a really strange thing I'll probably regret saying to you, but I think I was at someone's house and I looked down, we had our shoes off because we're usually a shoes off crew when we're inside a home, but I looked down and on my socks, I saw on the big toe, there was this little pinhole. Now for me, I'm a very particular person. So the fact that I saw a little hole, I know that it's gonna get bigger, you understand? I know what happens. And pretty soon you got a whole toe hanging out of that thing. Now some of you pride yourselves on the fact that you can poke a whole toe out of the hole in your sock. I'm just not like that. So it sort of horrified me that I was seeing it and I was at someone else's house. Because if I was at my house, I would have burned it and then I would have gotten another sock. Not really, but you understand. And so, you know what I did is when I got home, I was still thinking about it. And at some point, I not only threw that sock away, but I went through my entire sock drawer and I stretched them all out to make sure that if there's any socks in my sock drawer, it's gone. And then I went on Amazon and I ordered a whole new pack because I got my brands just like you. That's what I did. It was a house cleaning, you understand? I, went, I purged that drawer. Whew. And I'll tell you what, there's some things in your soul, in my soul, that need to be purged because they've been worn over this last season. There's some weary places. There's some worn places. There's some things that maybe got put away in the drawer that need to come out and get tossed. We need to go through some stuff in our life. And one of the things fasting is going to do is we're going to get to see the holes in our soul because God wants to fill them with something new. God wants to bring things about in our life and he does that through this season of being attentive to him. Friend, we can't just have our cake and eat it too. In fact, in America, I love America, I'm a patriot, but man, sometimes we wanna have the whole bakery and eat it too. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, can I have my cake and eat it? We want everything. And we've got to learn how to deny ourselves. We've got to learn how to carry the cross. We've got to learn how to say no to the flesh. And aren't you grateful that God designed a way, a God-ordained way of us humbling ourselves? It's not just saying no to food. It's saying yes to the Lord. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16, Jesus said to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. I don't even know if I could do that for you tonight. A gloomy face like the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. So they do religious things for results from other people. 
Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. They're seeking to be known by people. They're seeking to be, for others to make much of them. They're, they're, they're seeking to have status and position and people to think about them when they go to sleep or whatever they're thinking about. He's saying, that's not what this is about. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. And this is something that God has us to do. Now you might say, well, Ben, why are we doing this then as a congregation? Because that's what we see throughout scripture in both the Old Testament and the New. They did this as in a congregation. This isn't just an individual practice that we would have and hold just between ourselves and God. There are times for that, but there are congregational fasts. The point of this passage is not that we can't fast together collectively. The point of this passage is that when you fast, you don't go out of your way to let other people know how spiritual and amazing you are. But the implication in this text is when you fast, not if. So Jesus isn't commanding, but he is saying something to us. This is a practice just like prayer that I've called you to participate in. And I want you to have this because when we do something by faith, and he talks about the secret place, when we have something with God that God sees, and we're not out there showboating for the world to see and telling everybody else how awesome we are and how much we're doing, but we're actually saying, listen, we're standing before God and we're believing for things to change in fasting and prayer. When we do that as a community, friends, that is a place of power before God. In our weakness, he is strong. In our surrender, God will be victorious. And a lot of times these seasons bring us back to that type of faith, the type of faith that does actually move mountains. We've got mountains all around us right now. And I've said this to more than a few. I've said to them very clearly, if we really believe that things are as bad as they are, then why is there not a desperation for God like there ought to be? Friend, that's the question that I have for you and for me. If things are as bad as people are saying that they are, then why is there not a desperation for God? You know what fasting can do for us? It can bring us back to a desperation for God. We need God. We need God to come through. Say amen if you know that's true. All right, now I got a few more things that I wanna say to you tonight. I wanna stir you up a little bit. Can I do that? I'm gonna do it anyways. What happens when we fast? I got 10 things that happen, all right? I know you're rolling your eyes. Don't do it. No, no, no. Don't roll your eyes. Open your hands, amen? 10 things that happen when you fast. Number one, fasting brings about humility. Pride is not just the devil's sin. It is very often our sin as well. Not just the pride that says I'm better than you, but the pride that says I don't need God. The pride that lives life without a humility, a sense in which we walk with I need the Lord that's, that is exhibited by a life of prayer. A prayerless life is a revelation of a life that is not dependent on the Lord. Fasting can bring us back to a place where we can say, oh God, instead of just, oh, something else that's going on in the world. We see the landscape of all of the issues and the problems of our heart and our family and our neighborhood and our city and our world. We see all the problems and the something happens on the inside of us. We're going to see that. We don't want to stick our heads in the ground. That's not what I would advocate. But what I'm saying is we, we lift our heads up to God when we see the problems of our world. A messed up world is job security for an intercessor. I'm not sure if I meant that, but you understand. (laughs) No, I did mean that. I don't want it to stay this way, but if I want to see true transformation, then I've got to be a person that stands before the Lord. Fasting is a way of worshiping God through humbling ourselves. Romans 12, 1 and verse 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. This is offering our bodies. That's what we're doing through this. We're putting ourselves, our body on the altar and we're saying, Lord, we fully surrender to you. As we say no to one thing in the natural, we're saying yes to you as we pursue that which is spiritual. 
So fasting brings about humility. And I don't know about you, but I could have more humility in my life. Number two, fasting brings about clarity. In Matthew chapter four, Jesus was tempted by the devil. And he said, if you really are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. It's quite the temptation. And Jesus says to him, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is in a posture, in a place of fasting. He's fasting. He's hungry. The temptation comes to eat, to be persuaded from his pursuit of the Father. And Jesus says, there is something that is more valuable than food. That is the word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Fasting brings about clarity. We need to hear the voice of God. We're hearing everyone else's voice, but what is proceeding from the mouth of the Lord? Don't you want to become a reliable source for that which God is saying? I mean, I just want to ask you the question, do you not want to become that reliable source that when someone calls you, they can depend on you to be a voice of scripture, to be a voice of prayer, to be a voice of the Holy Spirit. And you're not wrong and you're not off and you're not anger and you're not full of judgment, but you are full of what God is saying. That's the kind of people that God is looking for to use in the world today. He's looking for us to be that. And to be that, we've got to be people that were like Jesus. And Jesus was like, listen, the temptation to want something different is going to come, but man doesn't live by bread alone or whatever you're offering me. Whatever you're trying to tempt me with, it doesn't, I don't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I believe through fasting and prayer, we receive from God in a way that otherwise doesn't often happen. Fasting and prayer. Number three, fasting brings about freedom. I always think it's interesting the story of Adam and Eve when they fell into sin. This whole thing, we fall into sin. We're subject to slavery to sin over some fruit. Food. Come on, somebody. That was the medium. I don't know why. That was the medium. Oh, actually, I do know why. Food, the cravings of the body, very powerful. The devil came to Jesus and we just read it. He, tra- he said, turn these stones into bread. It keeps coming up. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that he disciplines his body physically so that he doesn't become disqualified. I just think it's an interesting paradigm to begin to think through that you and I can be totally addicted through the cravings of the flesh as it is attached to food. Fasting is not merely about food. You understand, this is, this is important to, for us to understand. It's, it's not a divine diet, but there's something powerful that we find when we say no to something. Now, at the end of this, I'll talk about some of us are gonna have a different type of fast. I get that. We can substitute, we may have to. Some of us can do that. But historically, biblically, fasting is focused and centered on the issue of food. Fasting is not about getting what we want from God. It's about getting out of the way of God. So fasting brings about freedom. We see a release in our, in our lives. If you need God to break something free in your life, let me just tell you, fasting is not the fix-all, but it is a great start. Fasting is not the fix-all. Like you're not gonna love better after 21 days and you're not gonna just everything about you drip and look like Jesus, you understand? That's not what I'm promising you, but I am telling you it's a great start. It's a great start of disciplining ourselves so that we have more with the Lord than we did 21 days ago. Fasting also brings about revival, number four. Fasting brings about revival. This happens as God's people see the real God at work in the midst of the church. Friend, I've been just kind of reminiscing on the days when I came to Christ and the moments that I've seen the real work of revival. Now, I, I love reading books about the reviving work of the Holy Spirit th- throughout history. There are things that I read about I've never seen in my life, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, I wanna see that in my day. But what you see in these people is such a desperation, such a hunger, and that's what I'm longing for because when the desperation and the hunger for the Lord come, he satisfies that. God doesn't leave us in this perpetual state of longing where we're never satisfied. That's not what he does. He constantly is the one who not only gives us the hunger, but satisfies the hunger. That's the point. It's to break us free from appetites of any other thing in order to appropriate our appetite upon him. 
He brings about revival first in the church and also in the world. It causes us to share the gospel. It causes us to be in love with them again where we wanna share with people more than we wanna talk about the news, God forbid, or we wanna talk about anything else that we're consumed with. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What if the reason that we have a deficiency in the area of prayer is because we're consumed with something else? And so it doesn't bring us to a place of prayer because what is filling our heart is so much something else that it's coming out of our mouth all the time and prayer is just an afterthought at best. But when God is in front of us, prayer is just offered because he's ever before us and so we're just constantly drawing our attention and our heart to him, being reminded of who he is, the fact that we need a reviving work of the Holy Spirit I pray that we see revival. I believe that revival, in a sense, is upon us, but we've got to continue to press in and go after God. When I say revival, I'm talking about our hearts being healed. I'm talking about our past being cut off from us. I'm talking about our marriages becoming whole. I'm talking about our children returning to the Lord. I'm talking about our households being consecrated for God. I'm talking about the presence of the Lord being so strong that people come in our homes and they say something about it. Man, there's something different about you. There's something different about this home. I feel at peace when I'm here. There's something happening here. I, I wanna know what it is. There's, there's something happening when people are around you on your journey job and they sense that peace. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom where he is Lord, there's a peace that other people, I believe, can feel because it's tangible. It's not just some like mental thing that you have that you know you can live in a place of peace. It's where peace abides on your life. The shalom of God has satisfied you and it starts to extend through your life. The kingdom of God is tangible when you live in his, in his kingdom under his lordship. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that's when revival starts to touch the lives of other people. You're walking in, a, in this place where God is alive to you. You're aware, you're awake to him. And when you're aware and you're awake to him, there's something that happens to other people that are around you. People wanna be around you. And I just, it bothers me that anybody would have this sense of like, I don't wanna be around you, right? Now we know we're gonna have disagreements with people and that may cause them to have this sort of repulsion. I get that. But that shouldn't be every single person on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, you know what I'm saying. If the common denominator is us, let's fast and pray. <laughs> Number five, fasting brings about the power of the Holy Spirit. Fasting brings about the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that when Jesus goes into the wilderness to fast, what does it say when he comes out of the wilderness? He comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes into a place of fasting, he's tempted, he's in weakness, the angels come and minister to him, he comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. His ministry begins. The baptism with the Holy Spirit comes and the power of God flows through his life for the next three years until his crucifixion. That's what we see. If Jesus Christ needed to fast and pray, how much more do you and I need the same? You cannot have the ministry of Jesus without the life of Jesus. We just can't. So fasting brings about the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a passage, I can't read it to you, wouldn't, wouldn't have the time to do it. There's a passage of scripture in Matthew 17, verse 14 through 23. It's where Jesus and a couple of his disciples are on the Mount of Transfiguration and they come down from this sort of power Shekinah glory encounter where a couple of his disciples are just blown away and they've got the wrong mindset and Jesus is still dealing with that with his disciples then and now. Come on, I'm one of them. And he comes down and there's this father that approaches Jesus and he says, hey, I asked your disciples to cast a spirit out of my boy and they could not do it. And Jesus responds with that interesting comment. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I remain with you? This is not very encouraging if you were one of those disciples at that time. How long shall I remain with you? Why was he saying something like that? Because Jesus taught them how to minister to a situation like this. Faithless generation, how long shall I presently remain with you? And then this is the story where it's a young boy. The grammar of, the, of this particular passage would tell us this is a very small child. 
perhaps could be eight, seven, six years old. We don't know. But that's what it would suggest is a very young, a very young boy. And Jesus just cast the demon out of the kid. The kid was throwing himself into the fire, burning himself, trying to kill himself. Jesus just speaks that word. The demon comes out of the boy and he's free. And his disciples pull him aside a little bit later in the passage, the same passage I just talked about. And they said, why could we not do this? And Jesus says, this one can come out, only come out by prayer and fasting. Now we know that's a little margin note, but it's in enough manuscripts to say it. But it's interesting, if you ever thought about it, Jesus didn't go away for a week and fast. He just spoke to the spirit and it came out. He didn't go away for a week and fast. He didn't react by going away and fasting. Jesus lived a life of fasting and prayer. When you live a life of fasting and prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit is more available because in your weakness, he is strong. That's the point. Fasting is not for the strong. Fasting is for the weak. Fasting is not for the independent. Fasting is for the dependent, those that are dependent upon the Lord. And that's the principle. It's not just trying to get something from God. It's about ministering with God. And there are just seasons as we draw near to him, we notice that a sacrificial life before God in prayer and fasting brings about the power of the Holy Spirit and with it, revival. With it, revival. Number six, fasting brings about generosity for others. You read Isaiah 58. You should do that. We should do that during these 21 days. Isaiah 58 talks about the fast that God requires, which is not about some piety that others might know how spiritual we are, but rather it's about loosening the bonds of those that are experiencing suffering and oppression. It's about giving to those that are in need. It's about being mindful of others. In other words, if we're going to move truly in a spiritual posture towards the Lord, it's got to equal something that shows love for God and love for people. And God was indicting them through the prophet Isaiah that you are doing something, but it means nothing to me because your motives are wrong. You're overlooking the oppressed. You're overlooking the afflicted. They're right in front of your face and you're unwilling to do that which is righteous and right to the people that are in front of you. And yet you come to me and you, you, withhold, you don't eat food or you don't practice, you don't do some of the things that you normally would do and you offer sacrifices and you think that I'm gonna overlook all of this. He's like, is this the fast that I require? No, I want you to break the bonds of wickedness. I want you to loose those for the oppressed. I want you to be generous to other people. I want you to take care of the people in your world. And can I just tell you that when you read Isaiah 58, sometimes when people read Isaiah 58, I just go, oh, I cringe because they actually relate Whenever it says nation in the Old Testament, they relate that to our nation. I, I, we've got to stop doing that when we read the Bible. The nation of Israel was the covenant people of God. Our nation is not a covenant people to God. The church is the covenant people to God. The promises of God cannot be translated to a nation full of unbelievers and believers. That's wrong thinking. If we read the Bible, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. So when we read something in the old covenant that is specifically indicting people that have ascribed themselves to Yahweh God, we've got to translate that in the new covenant to people that have willingly said Jesus is Lord. Because everybody else that hasn't said Jesus is Lord is a target where we preach the gospel so that they might be able to say that before the time comes when everybody will. And so we've got to be careful that we don't subscribe ourselves to a nationalism because what that does is it stops us from being evangelists. I hope you heard what I said there. Because in 2020, I heard more sermons preached with the Old Testament as a, as a text whereby our nation should be, oh, we've gone so far away from God. Friends, there are millions of people in America that never believe Jesus Christ is Lord. They've never believed that. They didn't go away from God. They never started with God. We live in a pluralistic society. I'm not saying let's let it go to hell. I'm saying let's preach the gospel so that people can go to heaven and their hearts will be transformed and then we'll be all on the same page. It doesn't surprise me when a worldly person acts like a worldly person. How many of you got saved? <laughs> okay. Before I was saved, that's what I thought. And if you said, well, you really went away, far away from God, I'd say, I never believe in God. What are you talking about, man? It's weird. It's weird thinking. Anyways, do you understand what I'm, okay. 
I've heard too many sermons where people start out like that. They're like, see how far our nation has come away from God. I'm like, friend, you should be preaching with an ache in your heart that we would reach our nation. Because so many have never known Jesus. Tens of millions have never subscribed to the gospel that we believe in. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many, but I, if I just go by statistics and we say there's this many Christians in America, I don't believe it. I, I don't buy that 50% of our nation is Christian. I mean, if you look, do the history. You look, I've been to England. If you ever go to England, everything, there's just monuments to what God used to do. And there's atheists everywhere you go. Anyway, I won't get it. All right. That's not what's gonna happen here. We're gonna fast and pray, all right? Number seven. How did that go over? Did that go over okay? I almost feel like I should just do the whole message on that because you never know. I mean, you just, offense is not in the air. It doesn't matter. I know what I meant. Number seven, fasting brings about healing and deliverance. We see that also in Isaiah 58. Healing. You know, in Isaiah 58, he talks about when you begin, when you begin to move in generosity toward others, when you begin to move in giving toward others, when you begin to move to breaking the bonds of the oppression and setting the captives free. When you stand before God and you minister to men, when you're fasting in such a way where you're looking unto God and your heart's sensitive and then you move towards others, when that happens, it says, then your light will break forth and thy healing will be yours. And he says, when you stop pointing the finger at others, you read Isaiah 58. He says, when you stop pointing the finger at others, he talks about thy healing. Oh man, I wonder if we're stopping up something, a a work of God that he wants to do even in our own lives. Mm. When we fast and pray, it brings us to a place of repentance. When we come to a place of repentance, we look in the mirror and we see these things and we rid ourselves of the impurities. And when that happens, that healing water can flow through our lives. Friend, maybe we're not getting a breakthrough because we've got to get into a place of repentance and maybe we can't see the kind of repentance that we need to walk in because we have to step into a whole new place, a season of fasting and prayer before God. And in that context, God will give us a revelation of the repentance that we need to walk in. Sometimes you cannot see, I cannot see the kind of repentance that I need to walk in until I move towards God in a whole new way. I get out of my seat and I move towards him. That's what fasting does. Fasting also brings about testimonies, number eight. This is all about the glory of God and all that he does shines light on all that he is and that's certainly what we want, the testimony of the Lord. Number nine, fasting brings about protection. We see this in the life and ministry of Jesus. Angels ministered to him. Jesus was fasting and praying. He got tempted. He resisted the devil. It says angels, angels of God ministered to Jesus. What if angels of God The Bible says in Hebrews that they're ministering spirits sent to heirs of salvation. That in our weakness, God will dispatch angels to strengthen us and minister us. Maybe that's a crazy concept for you, but that's a biblical reality. That where we feel like we're gonna be weak, Ben, you don't know, I'm gonna fall over if I just go without a meal. You know, I'm just, there's no way I can. See, that's what comes out of our mouth. See, I can't, there's no way, I can't. What if God himself will begin to minister to you in supernatural ways to sustain you and protect you? In Isaiah 58, it says, I will be your rear guard. What does that mean? I will protect you. I will protect you. If you live this way, and this is the kind of fasting that you give, that you participate in, I will be your rear guard. I got your back. That'd be like the new Ben's International Version. And number 10, and finally, fasting brings about intimacy with God. We have more time to pray and seek the Lord. We have more time to meditate on his word and hear from him, which brings about repentance. Gerald, if you would uh, come up, we're gonna receive communion here in just a moment. I just wanna encourage you. When I got saved, um, somebody invited me to this little Assembly of God church and they sat about 225 people, including the balcony. And it was all the pews and, and all that. And we've got some nice pews over in the chapel. You know, those are like the, uh, the upgrade they're like the Lexus of pews, you know. Whoever sold us those were like, this. they were just showing us the different grades of pews. Anyways, we got nice ones. These were not those. These were like the ones that you need healing while you're sitting on them so that, you know, you, like it required a healing work of God. So, <laughs> and some, it's like Starbucks. They intentionally make the chairs uncomfortable so you don't stay there too long. 
That's my suspicion. Some of you work for Starbucks. It's possible. I don't want to sit in them too long. You can't sit in them right now anyways. <laughs> my illustrations are going downhill quickly. All right. <laughs> I almost wanted to sing a whole new world for you right there. Right? A lot, all right, you get it. Somebody invited me to this little assembly of God church and it sat about 225 people in these pews and then in the balcony they had these uh, old chairs and they were just cramming people in. So we had about 100 more people in that building and this was at the tail end of the Brownsville Revival. I don't know if any of you ever remember the Brownsville Revival but um, I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know what a revival was. I was just saved, set free from drug addiction and immorality and all that. I was just, I was clean for the first time in my life. I was clean I was just clean. I had no skeletons in the closet. I had nothing to hide. I, was, I wasn't ashamed anymore. I was just clean. And I, was, <laughs> and I didn't even know if I should go to the altar because God delivered me so thoroughly, even in my room, that I was like, I'm gonna go to the altar just for more. But it wasn't like just to, to confess my sin because I felt like, man, I got all this out. So I was going every night to, they were, they were there every night. The, the Brownsville Revival is in, at the tail end in 1999 and they were going every single night they had service. So when I came to Christ, I thought that was normal. Like you go to church every single night. But I couldn't go. So I was like three or four nights a week, I would go to this Assembly of God church and I didn't know anybody there. So I'd drag a few people with me and they would come and we would always, we would show up like five, 10 minutes, right? Uh, and that was late. If you didn't show up 30 minutes early, you wouldn't be able to sit on the floor. And so we'd show up five to 10 minutes early and we'd always have to go up in the balcony and you're just, it's sweating. And there were even pastors sitting up there with me and I didn't know who they were. I was just so excited on the edge of my dilapidated chair and hundred people pressed into this thing. Everybody's sweating, there's no AC. The guy that's preaching was not very dynamic. The worship was like some broken down speakers and everybody was off tune and the songs were playing for 10 minutes and... I mean, how many times can you sing the mercy seat before you pretty much know all the Bible has to say about it? And they just kept going and going, take me into the holy of holies. You remember that song? I heard that song a hundred times and that it was a little revival and they kept singing, take me into the holy of holies. And I was a brand new believer. I didn't even know what the holy of holies was. I thought this is a place I must go. I thought this little assembly of God church was the holy of holies, you know. And they would do offerings and, and they would have everybody come up and they didn't intend for everybody in every row to come up, but because it was so squished in order for the person here to give their offering, everybody, it took 30 minutes to do the offering and it was so simple and the guy would hold the, this offering bucket up, you come up front and he'd just pray in tongues for 30 minutes and hold this thing up. It was a hot mess. I mean, they're like literally, like generationally, I was like 19 years old. Like I would never have gone there. I would have looked at this and one moment turned around and went, these guys are about to pull out snakes. I'm not interested in what's going on here. The music's terrible. Nobody can sing on key. I don't think these are musicians. I'm not really sure if this guy ever went to school to preach. I don't understand. I, they need a revival, you know. The, but there was something special about that little chapel, and that was the presence of God. And I didn't have words for it. I couldn't explain it to you, but I would drag my 19-year-old friends to it. There was nothing attractional about it except one thing. I don't remember a sermon that that guy preached. I don't remember a song we sang except for those two songs because we sang them so much. I don't remember anything. I remember having to step over people because they'd come up for the offering and just fall on the ground and they had 15 people dedicated to move folks out of the way. And that sounds crazy, but the power was so strong, your knees would buckle when you'd go to give your offering. I was 19 and I just got delivered of all this stuff in my life. I long for that. When we pray for our young people and we strategize about how we're gonna keep the youth in church, there was nothing you could have done to attract a guy like me to what we do here. All of it was weird and strange, but that one thing that got my heart, he got me and he hooked me so strongly. I could, it's like that hook would not come out. I just was drawn to his presence. I wanted God. 
Friend, we want God. And what this season is, uh, is about for us is just saying, you know what? That was not just our history. That's our inheritance. Our inheritance is the presence of the Lord. I don't know what all of us do for a living. I don't know what our days look like. I don't know what our nights look like, what it's like for you in your home or how you live your life or what your family life is like. But I tell you, no matter what all of that looks like, enter the powerful presence of God and everything in our life begins to change. He begins to massage our hearts. He begins to soften us so that love comes where there's anger. He begins to release us of the bonds of unforgiveness for family members that have mistreated us and people that have just done things that are unspeakable. God begins to move inside of our hearts because all we long for is him. And when he does that, when he moves in us like that, we won't say no. You don't need somebody up here railing about how we ought to live our life. There's a leadership of moving towards him and our hearts say yes. The psalmist says, seek my face, God says. And the psalmist said to the Lord, your face, Lord, I will seek. This season, may we get back to a place where we say that in every fiber of our being, your face, Lord, I will seek. In the face of everything else, every other voice, your face, your voice, your word, I will seek. We're so glad you were able to join us today. We would like you to find out more about Northwest Church by going to our website, nwcfoursquare.org, or downloading our app in any of the app stores by searching Northwest Foursquare Church.